We're going to talk about bullets this morning. Bullet technology. The design of bullets. How bullets perform, actually perform on game. Bullets that have been recovered from game. Game that I've shot, people that I've been with, I've been recovering bullets. I'm 68 years old. I've been recovering bullets since I was about 15 years old. And what really started this to do with, with that aspect, when I was 15 years old, where I lived in the mountains, we had about 15 inches of fresh snow. I knew there would be a considerable number of elk around. I was dropped, had I had my granddad drop me off back back in a few miles, and I took off by myself with my day pack and my rifle and enough to eat for the day, hunting elk. In about an hour, I shot an elk at, at 350 yards. I laid down prone. I had a good rest. Elk was standing still, broadside. I shot it just slightly ahead of the armpit, in somewhat into the shoulder area. I was, I was shooting a, a 300 H&H &H Magnum. I was shooting Sierra, 168 grain Match King bullets. And I also shot some 168 grain Hornady Match King bullets. So I shot the elk, the elk went down, gathered myself up, I went over there, there's no elk dropped into kind of a depression. Well, this is the second time I've shot an elk in my lifetime. So I got to figure out what to do. I start tracking this elk. Well, I followed this elk all day. And I gave up because I knew it was fruitless after about six and a half hours of walking. I was traveling country that I wrangled horses in. I knew, knew the country. I knew the game country just as a young, young fellow, 15 years old. And I had to think about that. And it's been on my mind in all these years since, for 53 years since. And I'm gonna tell you what happened. The bullet didn't travel into the body cavity of the elk. It couldn't have. And the reason I say it couldn't have, if it traveled into even one lung, the elk would eventually bled, and I'd found him dead. That's not what happened. What happened was that thin jacketed cup and draw style bullet just simply went in a short ways and disintegrated into a little something just like this. All we've got here is a piece of bullet jacket. This happens to be a piece of bullet jacket from a 185 grain match hunting burger bullet, very low drag bullet. It's basically the very same bullet that I used 53 years ago and never recovered an elk. Now we got a, a, a bunch of folks recommending that we use these, these match type bullets because that's all that these burger bullets are are match type bullets. They're very thin jacketed bullets. They have no integrity to hold them together. A boat tail bullet will shed its lead core on impact very easily because there's nothing to hold it in there. It's got a taper in the back end and the lead core slips ahead on impact. These, these burger bullets, the Sierra bullets, they're all one and the same thing. They're made the same way, thin jackets, pure lead core, they've got a, maybe a different profile, but in the front end, they've got a huge cavity in the front end. When that bullet hits something, it just goes, goes to hell. In a lot of instances, they disintegrate. I've tried this bullet. This bullet here happens to be a 130 grain burger low drag hunting bullet and that bullet won't even make it into the body cavity of a, 
of a buck deer shot in the shoulder area. Well, that just is not what you want. Real game bullets have to penetrate into the body cavity, into the lungs, into the heart, both lungs, clear over into the off shoulder, maybe against the hide, or maybe out the other side of the animal. And if that bullet doesn't, doesn't do that, it is just simply not a game bullet. And I've had people remark to me, well, technology allows us to do some of these things. There's no new technology between the 168 grain Sierra bullet, section one for yourself. I've been sectioning bullets, on, you know, all these years. I've sectioned these bullets. I've shot these bullets. I've tried them on game. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. And people telling me that they have a situation where these bullets work better for them than some of these premium bullets that companies invested millions of dollars in to sell to hunters that really work. In 1983, I was shooting a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. Sarah had come out with a 175 grain Spitzer boat tail Game King bullet. That basically is the same bullet as these match bullets. It's got the thin jacket, the profile like these match bullets have with a boat tail, long streamlined bullet, except it's got a small lead tip. Well, I shot an elk. I shot an elk at 600 yards with that bullet. The elk was in misery. The elk wasn't going anywhere. But I had to finish this elk. The elk was down, but it was crawling down a steep embankment towards me at 600 yards. This is way before we had any reticle systems, really, for scopes. Adjustments that we've got now, scopes we can adjust and so forth. I was guessing, I was guessing, my very best guess, that's what the yardage was, and I still think it's right real close to the 600 yards. With that elk angled downhill towards me, I held on the root of his tail and I shot him right in the center of the skull and both of his antlers flopped to the side. This was a five point bull. Now I've got a dead elk. When I dressed that elk out, when I dressed the elk out, I discovered the remaining parts of that 175 Sierra Game King bullet. Here it is. Performed no better than these match bullets performed many years before that I shot that elk with that I never recovered. This bullet was in the, in the off shoulder. It made it through the lungs. I shot him through the lungs. The elk was going to die. I probably maybe didn't need to shoot him again. But I couldn't stand to see him suffer. Anyway, when this elk walked, it crunched this bullet. You can see this bullet. It's smashed right here. It's got no lead in it. That's an empty jacket. That's an empty jacket. It peeled, it peeled back far enough. It peeled back far enough. It expanded far enough. But here's just what I described. These boat tail bullets shed their core. There's, no, there's no, nothing to hold the core in there because the base of the bullet is tapered, slips out on impact, it's gone. Well, that finished me. That finished me on, on that using that bullet. I wanted to use a 7 millimeter. I liked the 7 millimeter. I went from there. The next year, I was shooting 175 grain nozzle partitions. There was the bullet. That is still the bullet. I've killed elk from, from 25 yards away with the partition bullets out to 825 yards. It's always, always worked for me. It's always penetrated into the body cavity of, of a bull elk, a cow elk, whatever I've, I've wanted to shoot. And I've recovered some of these nozzle partitions. I have quite a few here. Here's 
Here's a 175 grain nozzle partition, expanded perfectly. It's got the partition that sheds the front, the front lead core, leaves the, all the rest of the bullet to drive on through to the other side. These bullets are always right there in the meat, or right in the right in the hide, or maybe just start to break the hide on the offside. When the bullet hits the side, the hide it's kind of elastic and it springs back and it stops it. I've recovered these nozzle partitions. They always work really, really swell for me. And, and I've shot elk at almost every angle. I've even shot them in the back hip and, and slowed them down because that's all that I had at the time and caught up with them because they were in poor damn shape and killed the elk. But if I would have shot that elk in the hip with one of these 175 Sierra Game Kings that I described a moment ago and have shown you this this bullet that has totally shed its lead core, there's nothing There's nothing left there. There was no weight. That lead core probably shed about along halfway it was travel or, or maybe even before that. So it, it really didn't work. But we've got folks hung up on some of this technology. Well, those two technologies there, bullet designs, it's still the same technology. It really isn't any different. It doesn't change the technology by putting a lead tip on a match bullet other than any more than it would change the technology by taking a lead tip bullet, taking the lead off, tip off the bullet and making it a bullet like this burger bullet. These burger bullets are just simply nothing but match grade accurate bullets put in a box and sold to you as hunting bullets. Well, if it was all that easy, why have we come all this way? Why did John Nosler, many years ago, when he was hunting in Canada, come home very disappointed with the bullets that he used, and he happened to have been using the 300 H&H &H Magnum that I used many, many years ago. He came home, went to work with a simple lathe, and made a few bullets and we know the Nosler story most of us do by now it was a tremendous success the Nosler partition built built Nosler, Nosler bullets and they've advanced into some other areas and made other bullets over the years and advanced from the Nosler partition into the ballistic tip bullet and then into the Acubon type of bullets and They've got long-range Acubons now, and bullets that supposedly will expand down to 1,300 feet a second. Well, people think that technology has taken it to where we can shoot way, way, way farther than we should be shooting. Just because the bullet expand down to that far doesn't mean that you need to shoot that far. It takes the hunt. It takes the hunt out of everything. The most exciting hunting situations that I've been on is not the elk that I killed at 825 yards. The most exciting one was the herd of elk that I followed into the timber. And when the when the when the elk got up at, at 35 yards, I killed it dead right there, because I slipped in the timber, living with those elk, and I. Killed the elk right there. That's really hunting. But sniping, sniping from extreme distance, it's not hunting. It removes it removes all that excitement and everything. But we've got these people with, with these great big eagles that want to do these things. So people are going to continue to do it. But you need to use the right bullets the right thing for the job. Up here on the this first line up of bullets, these are all Barnes bullets. Well, Randy Brooks has designed designed these Barnes X triple shock bullets. And they're they're very, very good bullets. They, they those bullets probably hit game harder than any bullet made for whatever caliber it is. They're made out of out of copper, you know, pure copper and with a small cavity in the front, the cavity is closed up when the bullet's formed, 
and you can see the you can see these bullets. Here's a recovered bullet. This is a recovered bullet from a bull elk at, at 365 yards. This is a 145 grain, seven millimeter bullet. This is their long range triple shock bullet, boat tail bullet. This bullet obviously performed perfectly. This bullet went in the chest of a bull elk at 365 yards and penetrated through the hip bone, was against the hide and in the meat on the opposite side of the elk. That bullet penetrated the full length of an elk. You know what you have to go through to penetrate. You gotta go clear through the guts and everything else. You know, you went through the, the working part of the elk, went through lungs, through the, the, you know, through the chest, through the lungs, through the body cavity of the elk, through the fleshy part of the hip, through the hip bone against, that's a game bullet. That's a real game bullet. And the nozzle partitions will do the same thing. You can shoot in one end of them, and they'll go to the other end, and perhaps you'll find the bullet. And every bullet has its limitations. Every bullet has its limitations, but some bullets have a lot more limitations than others. And I've, I've described here these real thin jacketed bullets. I'm very, very much against anybody using this type of a bullet on game because I know what it does. Yeah, there's, there's situations where the bullet worked and has killed the animal. But bullets that are designed to penetrate two to four inches and explode are not game bullets. Bullets that are designed to penetrate, clear through the body of an elk or a deer or whatever we might be shooting, those are game bullets. And I have found the, the swift line, line of bullets to be very good. They've got a partition in them. They're, they're basically it's an, can be described as an H mantle type of a bullet. They also make a streamlined swift rock a bullet and that's a tremendous bullet. I found it to be very, very good in 180 grain, 30 caliber Swift Rocco. They've got a very thick jacket. Those are not made out of gilding metal like some of these other bullets are made out of. Those are made out of copper. And they're one of the first people to put a small, a considerably small plastic tip in the bullet. These bullets have a very high ballistics coefficient. They shoot much, much flatter than what the ballistics coefficient says. All you gotta do is test them and figure it out just like, just like I have. And we're, we're still talking here about some technology. Now we're gonna talk here about, you know, these ballistics coefficients. These ballistics coefficients, basically, yeah, they can be measured. They can, they can be checked with, with Doppler radar and one thing or another. But this, this sort of thing changes with, ele with elevation. And it changes with barometric pressure. And you need to go to information. There's information out there that these ballistics coefficients aren't absolute. I've proven day after day when I'm shooting on my range here at long range, and I can shoot to 850 yards, that the particular ballistics coefficient, according to drop figures, is not what it is. It's what it is on the day that I shot it, in the cartridge that I shot it, the velocity under all the conditions of that day. That's what the ballistic coefficient was that day. Ballistic coefficient is not the same on another day. Your zero is not the same on another day because all these conditions change. So we're hung up on technology here. People that are trying to push the limit, push the limit way out there to extreme long, long range. And I've seen these things prove out. People buy, people buy a rifle from, from an entity. All you got to do is, is just dial the scope. You know, loads have been worked up for the rifle. You got the velocity figures. You got the ballistics coefficient. You make a custom dial for the scope, and all you got to do is dial. Well, folks, it isn't really quite that simple. It all sounds good in theory. 
It all sounds good in theory, and if you could shoot in a controlled environment, in a tunnel, in a building, in a tunnel of a building where nothing changes, everything's the same, every time you shoot, the temperature's the same, there's no wind, there's no light change, everything exactly the same, that's one condition. But shoot out here in the game field, that's an entirely different situation. Because we've got wind, we've got barometric pressure, we've got shot angle, many, many, many factors that enter into this. And my son happens to be a guide. He's an extremely good, good guide. Guides hunters. He's especially good at guiding elk hunters. He had an elk hunter year before last, and his, the outfitter he works for, they were together with the hunter. The man had a rifle that he bought from an entity that had, you know, a custom dial on it, load worked up. It was a 300 Winchester Magnum. They spotted an elk at 1,239 yards. The guy wanted to shoot this elk. All I got to do is just dial my scope. They would not let him shoot at that elk. After a while, it ended up that the elk was, was at was at 932 yards. Well, they got him they got him prone, they got him into position very carefully. They range finded it with three range finders. And he dialed he dialed for the for the correction of the range and he shot. Well both the guide and the outfitter were watching the comet tail of the bullet go in from behind the hunter. My son and the outfitter saw this bullet go in and hit at the elk's feet. Where was the precision? Where was the precision? Mm -hmm. He dialed a scope. He was told by the outfit that he, all he had to do was just dial the scope and he could kill the elk. The guy spent quite a bit of money to get an elk permit. He spent a lot of money to be guided on an outfit and hunt and he went home empty handed. He went home empty handed because of his attitude and because of what he wanted to try to do. He was doing something beyond his capabilities and beyond his understanding and beyond the capability of the rifle. Because real obviously, you know, the, the, the dial was not correct for the trajectory of, of that particular load. For one thing, it was a 300 Winchester Magnum and at 932 yards the energy has fell way, way off. We should have an energy of around 1,800 to 2,000 foot-pounds for elk size game. The energy was considerably below that. Long before that, the energy had fell below that energy level. But I've been led to believe that the technology, this technology, all this specialness that we've come up with, we can use an app. All we got to do is look at our app on our smartphone, and we can do this, and we can do that, and we can do something else. Well, I'm trying to explain to you here, it isn't working. It isn't working. Yeah, it can work sometime for somebody somewhere under under situation. What's it gonna What's it gonna be the next time? What are you gonna have the next time? Is it gonna work for you? Perhaps it will, perhaps it won't. If you're going to shoot a long range, I had this put to me by a retired military sniper of 43 years. He said to me, he said, Randy, he said, if you're going to shoot at any distance at game, you need to practice in a hunting situation. You need to practice in a hunting position. You need to sit down. You need to kneel. You need to be prone. You need to be standing up. And you need to shoot Choose whatever you'd like, a five or six inch paper target or a five or six inch gong. And if you can hit that gong at 200 yards in four or five hunting type positions, move it out 100 yards and see if you can still hit that target at those distances under a hunting situation. And keep moving it out, moving it out until you miss. That means you only get one shot out of a cold barrel at those distances. You wait for the barrel to cool, one shot out of a cold barrel, just like you would 
duplicate your hunting situation if you're going to kill an animal. You miss that target, you miss that five or six inch target at 400 yards, that means that you got no business shooting at anything at 400 yards because you missed it. You back up 50 yards or you back up 100 yards and shoot again and practice. Improve yourself. Maybe you can gain, maybe you can gain that 100 yards. Maybe finally, after a while, you become proficient enough to shoot at 400 yards or 500 yards, whatever it is. But if you can't hit out of a cold barrel the, with the first shot at these targets, you've got no business under any set of circumstances shooting at our majestic wildlife, a, a beautiful living animal. You've got no business shooting at it if you're going to wound it. You probably don't have the tracking ability. I have tremendous tracking ability. My son's got tremendous tracking ability because we're hunters. We hunt, we get in close to our game. That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to kill our game with one shot if we possibly can. And these extreme situations, it's all been brought on because of this hang up that people are on the technology, the technology. Well, I've tried to explain some of this technology. It still doesn't take you any further. It really doesn't take you any further. It just kind of builds up your ego. Look at what I did. Look at what I did. Well, yeah. What are you going to do the next time? How many times are you going to have to shoot at that elk? Guys say, well, look, I can sit here I can sit here and I can read this wind. There's not anything on the face of this earth that's available to you or I or any other shooter that wants to shoot game at extreme ranges, a thousand yards or whatever it might happen to be, that's going to tell you what that wind's doing down there at a thousand yards. It's not going to tell you. There's nothing that's going to tell you what it's doing all the way in between. I have a shooting situation here from my home where I shoot. Let's say we got we got a couple mile an hour breeze right here at the bench. And I'm going to shoot I'm going to shoot at 850 yards. Well, here's the real situation. I know this because I live here, I do it. But where you are and you just encounter a situation, you haven't been across that terrain, all that terrain between here and that animal. You don't know what's going on there. So I shoot from my bench it has to go across two gullies. It's got to go over the top of a ridge, out onto the top of a flat, down into a deep canyon, up on a ridge where that elk is at 850 yards. Well, between here and where that ridge is, I can walk down there, and the wind is blowing four or five times harder there than it is at the bench. So that means if I got two, three mile an hour wind here at the bench. I've got probably a 15 mile an hour wind when we walk on the top of the bench. Now we walk off the bench, we go down just a little bit down in the canyon, there's no wind. There's no wind down in that canyon. Now we come up out of the canyon, as we come up out of the canyon, all of a sudden now we're back out way up here in the open. Now we're back up into the wind again for that elk standing on the mountain. There isn't anybody ever and there never will be anybody that can read the conditions that I just described to you or know what it is, period. They just simply don't know. There's, there, there's, there's not any technology that you're ever going to buy today, tomorrow, or next year, or 10 years from now that's going to do this all for you and makes this ethical to take game at these extreme distances. This is all about ego. It's all driven by ego. We're shooting many, many bullets that aren't capable. The energy's not there. We've got people describing that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting elk at 800 yards with a 6.5 Creedmoor. Do you know what the energy of a 140-some-odd grain bullet out of a 6.5 Creedmoor is at 800 yards? It started out at 2,700 feet a second at the muzzle. At 800 yards, you got about 700-and-some-odd foot-pounds energy at 800 yards. Maybe somebody's killed an elk that far with a 6.5 Creedmoor. Did that make it an elk cartridge? You know? And 
anyway, these, these energy figures, in almost all these instances where people have described that they've taken game at these extreme ranges, nobody ever mentions anything to do with energy. Energy and ballistics coefficient go hand in hand. If we've got higher ballistics coefficient, it's going to carry more energy downrange. Yes, it does carry more energy downrange. But you don't go b way below, go down to a third or a fourth of the energy that you really need to kill the game. Is that using technology? That's ignoring the technology that was given to you with these high ballistics coefficient bullets. Just plain and simple. You've went beyond, you've went way beyond technology doesn't enter anymore. Now, now what it comes down to, well, you know, I did it, so you really don't know what you're talking about, you know, and, and one thing or another. Well, why, why in instances are people shooting, shooting game at these distances? Not once, not twice, not three times, seven, eight times, 12, 13, 14, 15 times, using a whole box of ammunition and maybe only hitting that, that elk two or three times at that distance. If the technology is so wonderful, why didn't you hit it 20 times out of the box of 20 rounds of ammunition? If technology was so damn wonderful, and you can do all these things, and you're using technology, how's come it didn't work? Evidently, you're not up to it. The technology's not there that you think's there. The gun's not up to it, and you're shooting too far. And you don't have the energy. You hit an elk with one of these little small calibers. Let's shoot an elk. Let's shoot an elk at 800 yards with a 6.5 Creedmoor, 140, some odd grain, you know, EDLX, EDLX bullet that a few people seem to be hung up on. That's also a thin jacketed bullet. It's got a slim profile. It's got the ballistics coefficient. It's got a plastic tip. I've had it described to me. I've had people describe to me, uh, you know, taken from elk at somewhere in the neighbor, neighborhood of 900 yards, one of these bullets. The plastic tip was gone and the front end was just started to just kind of curl back a little tiny bit. The only reason that the elk died is because the elk happened to have been shot right here in the neck. It broke its vertebrae. It, 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 it ruined things there. Severed the spinal column. The bullet hung up in there, and the people found found the bullet. It's supposed to be real high technology, this EDLX bullet. Well, it can't be that good. Why didn't it make it through the, the neck of an elk at that distance? It it did kill the elk. What would have happened if you if you shot that elk in the shoulder? It couldn't have made it through the shoulder. It didn't make it clear through the neck of an elk. Neck of an elk is about as wide as my head. It didn't make it through that. So time and time and time again, using just plain old everyday savvy understanding of these things, having hunted a lifetime, this is what I'm explaining to you. This is what I want to point out. And if you're if you're attempting these things way past the capability. That's not doing anything at all for the hunting fraternity. It's went way beyond the ethics. And at some point, people need to control themselves. <laughs>